Okay, I got to start with this because I'm sure there's some people like me in this room this morning uh, that allergies is just taking a toll on you. Anybody fighting this? I walk outside for 10 seconds and my eyes are like just so poofy. So you're going to hear that a little bit today, but bear with me on that. And like Dan said earlier, we're going to be tackling a, a piece of passage in 1 Peter. We're going to be starting chapter 3 today as we continue the stand series. And let me make sure before we start chapter 3, let's talk about what stand is, what this series is. The heartbeat of the series is acknowledging that we live in a world that's going to be difficult at times, where there's going to be struggles at times. And we are called as a believer to put our hope in our faith in Jesus so we can stand in the midst of trials. And, and I wanna just, we're gonna break down this uh, first part of chapter three here, but I wanna talk about a lie that Americans, we've been kind of seeing for a long time. I call this the Disney lie. You ever watch a Disney movie? I, I, I'll give you the plot of 98% of Disney movies. There's a princess. She's lonely. Nobody, she has no friends, no family. Mom and dad probably died. And then comes a knight in shining armor. They have some ups and downs to get to the place where they finally fall in love after two days. <laughs> and after two days, they're ready to commit the rest of their life to each other. And they get married, and the, every Disney movie usually ends, and they lived happily. Because that's all you need in marriage, right, is love. That's the lie. Marriage takes work. Now, it, I don't want you nudging your partner here and saying, see, listen. No, but this is this passage here. And we're going to dive into the dynamics of a husband and a wife, how we respond to what Peter's writing here, how we live in today's culture with the understanding of godly truth that doesn't often align with the culture we live in. But I want to set the tone for this passage, and I'm going to jump to verse 7 here. Chapter 3, verse 7 of Peter says this, Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. This idea of heirs with each other. This is important here because it's, it's showing us in this passage in verse seven that everything we're gonna talk about, yes, is true and we're gonna, we're gonna align ourselves to it, but we are equal in the eyes of God as husband and wife. That, that, that there's not one greater in the eyes of God. We're gonna talk about some structure systems and how we operate in a marriage, but we are heirs together. And I wanna just set that tone because I've heard people weaponize this passage before. They've weaponized it in their marriage. They've weaponized it in their relationships. And I want to make sure we are clear on the tone that this is not a passage that's changing the equality of man and woman in a marriage. It is very clearly that we are equal in the sight of God. Everybody good with that? Okay. Just want to make sure we're clear. Because now I'm going to read verse 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. We've seen this theme here of likewise the last couple chapters. And once again, let me just set this. Likewise, first we had likewise be subject to the governors. Then we had likewise be subjects to masters. And now we see kind of the family structure starting here in chapter three. Likewise, wives be subject to your own husbands. This is an interesting one here in chapter three because he's speaking to a wife who is married to an unbelieving man. Be subject to your own husbands that even if they do not obey the word, they may be one. Now, let's go back to chapter two here real quick just to really see what we're talking about here. Chapter two, verse 11 says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of flesh which wage war against your soul. This idea that he's speaking to the believer who is an exile or a sojourner in their ultimate um, residence is in heaven with Jesus. And now he's speaking to the wife who is a sojourner or an exile in her own marriage because she's married to someone who doesn't align with Jesus. Now, I know some of you are thinking right now, okay, we're doing the husband-wife talk. What can I get out of it? I'm unmarried. 
I'm young. I, 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 what, I, there is so much truth in this passage, in verse, this chapter three, that even the focus is marriage. There is something in here for you. I wanna challenge you to prepare yourself with the knowledge of this passage. It says, be subject for the Lord's sake. We talked about that, the governments, the powers. But I wanna draw, can you put the passage back up for me real quick? Very important word here. It says, be subject to your what? Own husband. I, I think this is a very important word here because it's not calling the woman just to be subject to every male figure. It's saying in your household, be to your husband. And then it says, conduct. Let your conduct be this. I want this, this picture it's painting here is that the wife is being challenged as an exile in a way of winning her husband inside of their own marriage to conduct herself in a certain way, in a way of winning him to the Lord. Now this is the conduct that's talking about here in chapter three, but there's truth for the family structure in this conduct. So how do we work through this? First, the clear message for me in this passage is that conduct will be a strong message to the unbeliever. That, that the conduct of how a Christian lives, in this specific case, a woman of faith, how she lives, that conduct will be a message. And how does she win him in this passage in verse one? Well, it says first, without a word. See, because at this point, the husband and wife, they, she, it is known that she believes in Jesus. It, it's not that her speaking is going to change. It's the conduct of her life. I think sometimes as the believer, we think we just need to keep sharing verbal truth, which is true. But if we are only verbalizing truth and not living truth, it's not going to change the person like we would like. Now, sometimes it will, but I firmly believe that... The, as a believer, my strongest message is when my, my speaking of truth back up with my living of truth. So it's without a word. And then it, called, and then it also says respectfully. Respectful. This is a call to her in this passage, this woman, this wife, to live in a respectful way. Not, old, not, just, not just respectful to her husband for the sake of being respectful to her husband, but to have such respect of the calling of God in her life that she lives this way within her marriage. Respect is a big deal. I think one of the quickest things that destroys marriages today is when the, the thing called disrespect starts to find its way in. You want to tear a man down very quickly. Let him know you don't respect him. And it will tear him down. The, the third one here is this call to purity. You see this in the, the passage here, a call to pure conduct and living. It's, it's calling the wife here to have a moral compass above reproach. To live purely. This is a call to every believer, but it's a call especially to this woman who's married to an unbeliever here in 1 Peter 3. To, that if you are going to proclaim me, he's saying, if you're going to proclaim the name of Jesus, you are called to live purely or to be, be holy, which means to be set apart. Let's, let's read verses three and four here where it says this. Let's con it continues this talk. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear but let your adorning be the hidden person of your heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. If you have your Bible, circle God's sight here. In just a couple verses, we're gonna get back to why this is really important. But this idea of the sight of God, and in God's sight, this is important. This passage, I mean, maybe you heard it right away. It's talking about this adorning, this external beauty, and this internal beauty, which is hidden in you. The beauty of Christ in you. It's saying, live with that. And I want to make sure this is clear, because sometimes people say, well, you can't braid your hair then. Guys, this has really nothing to do with the braiding of hair. Because let me read this again, just so we're clear. Do not... Uh, by the braiding of your hair and the putting on of gold jewelry. Okay, you can't braid your hair, you can't have gold jewelry. Was Peter saying this then? Or the clothing you wear? Is it really about that? No, was he expecting every, the, the women just to walk around naked? They can't, they're not allowed to wear clothes? 
No, I know there's some husbands who are like, yes, that's what he was saying. <laughs> yes, I think so. Thank you, Pastor Shane. No, that's not what he's saying. He, he, he's drawing this idea here of these things that in that time specifically was what a, a woman in her marriage would use to win her husband. He's saying, don't let those things, the fancy hair or the gold jewelry or the nice clothes, be the things that, that make you operate. Let it be your gentle and quiet, reverent awe of God. Let it be how you worship God. God. Clothing's not the main point here. In fact, adorning, the, uh, the, uh, the word adorning means the focus of. Don't let the focus of your life be what you externally wear or what you put on to oppress others. Let the focus of your life be the Lord and Savior Jesus radically changing you from the inside out and that going outward to the people around you. See, we can get really good, both Wives, husbands, male, female, we can get really good at looking a certain way, but on the inside, we're dead. This is saying, I don't care how you look, and we see this throughout Scripture. We see this call to the Pharisees and the Sadducees to, don't, don't just show me the outside, show me the inside. See, here's why this is important. All that stuff, clothing, braiding of hair, the, the fancy outward impression, the world can do that. The world, the world can do that. What Peter's calling the wife here to is to live her life in such a way that it could be only God. See, because we can dress up, we can present all these things, so can the world. But only God can change someone from the inside out and change their eternity forever. Amen? Verse four, let's go back here. It says this, but let the adorning be the hidden person of the heart with imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. I love the word imperishable here because I, I hate to break it to you. You are perishing. I know it's hard to believe, but it's truth. We all are. We're all going in, in our, our external beauty. The things of this world are, they're going one way and it's not always the best way, you know what I mean? Um, but it's going towards an end point, but let the imperishable beauty of God in your life be the focus. Stop trying to hide it with all this worldly stuff. Let God inside of you be the focus of your life. So how does a woman do this if you break down this passage? If you're breaking down just specifically, how does a woman do this? Verse five puts it very clearly. For this is how the holy woman who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. This is how a holy woman does this. She hopes in God. That her hope is not in this world. Her hope is not in her husband. Because I I know that if your hope is in your husband, he will let you down. I I let my wife down all the time. I'm getting better. But it's the holy woman whose hope is in God, can live this way because she is not making her husband the God of her life. God is her ultimate authority so she can live this way like Peter's calling her to here because her ultimate authority is God and this is how he calls her to live. Remember, we've seen this theme over the last two chapters. Be subject to this, be subject to this, be subject to this. This is God as my ultimate authority submitting me under earthly authority. Verses five and six put it like four, four real points here from what this submission looks like. For this is how a holy woman whose hope is in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. So four points here that we see in Peter. What does this submission look like in a godly woman? One, holy having a life that's set apart. Two, her hope is in God. Three, a call to good deeds, you see there, to do good. And the fourth is to live fearlessly. Fearlessly. This is a call for the woman who is, they're speaking to, the wife here, to have a fearless awe of God that does not make them fear this world. This is not a call to the woman to to be passive and scared. This is a call for a strong woman to live fearlessly. I want to talk real quick about what submission is and what submission isn't before we go any further. I'm going to read verse 1 again here. 
Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. Real quick, if you're taking notes, write these five things down. What submission isn't? Submission is not agreeing on all important issues. You see this here in verse one. This is being spoken to a wife who's trying to win her husband over. They don't even agree on Jesus here, but he's still calling this authority structure. It's not agreeing on everything. It's not, it's not agreeing on everything, too. It's not the absence of thought. You can see in this passage that Peter is calling the woman, calling the wife to be very thoughtful in how she is presenting her life to an unbelieving husband. It's almost strategic in how she is living her life to win her husband to Christ. It's three, it is not uh, avoiding change. The goal here is to what? Win her husband to Christ, which is a drastic change, isn't it? This isn't just, uh, submission here is not just the avoiding of change and let's just stay the same. No, there's a goal here of change. It is definitely not the will of the husband over the will of God. This is not a call for the wife to join the husband in sin. This is not a call for the wife to live her way, I mean, to live her life if her husband is in sin, to follow him blindly into sin. This is not what that call is. And this is definitely not a fear of the husband because it closes in verse five with do not fear anything. Be fearless in this structure. What is it? What does this biblical submission look like? It's the divine calling to fearlessly honor and affirm leadership and partner in it with your God-given gifts. That's what it is. Verse seven. Okay, that was easy, right? Now let's get to verse seven here. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. All right, guys, your turn. Your turn. Likewise, the structure system, again, you see that word, likewise. It's the same, it's, it's, it's saying here, we're calling you to the same kind of thing as governments, masters, and now we're in the marriage system. Likewise, be subject to the Lord for the Lord's sake here. And then we see here to live in an understanding way. A godly husband will be one who understands his wife. Now, I know some of you are like, no idea. I, I'm trying. Here's the truth. A godly husband will pursue understanding. Will, will daily, other passages here use the word dwell with, to live with, to dwell closely with, to develop an understanding of his wife. And he will also, in this passage it says, by showing honor. A godly husband knows how to make his wife feel honored. I want you to wrestle with that question, husbands. Do you know how to do that? Or here's an even harder question. If you're honest, have you even cared enough to try to understand and to honor? I think this is a call here we see very clearly. And I know this kind of passage doesn't seem to fit in today's culture, but I want to let you know, when Peter is writing this, this is a radical pro-woman message. Because in this time, this is a radical teaching in the world Peter lived in, in this ancient culture, a husband had absolute rights over his wife and, had virtually no, and she had virtually no right in marriage. In the Roman world, if a man caught his wife in adultery, he could kill her. And if, she, if he caught her in adultery, he could kill her. But if she caught him in adultery, there was nothing she could do. See, Peter's radical teaching here is that the husband has God-ordained duties and obligations to his wife. This is a radical piece of scripture, Peter's saying, because it's no longer just because you are the man, you are the hierarchy on the man. It's saying, yes, this is the structure God has put in place for God-honoring submission, but you better understand that you have a duty to God to do it well. Radical. That you are called by God to live as a husband in this way. So how does a husband do this? I know you guys got weekend plans, so I'm going to be quick here. Go, you got weekend plans to go talk about all this. How does a man honor his wife? First, he is a man of God. 
He leads spiritually. He leads spiritually. First Timothy 6 says this, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Well, how does a man do this? How does a man live under the structure? He leads spiritually. Guys, I want to say this. We're going to get to this a little bit later. I want to speak specifically to the husbands. As a young husband myself, I am not a pro in this. I am growing in this. I am seeking after God to continue to fight for this. But men, you need to hear me. We have a calling over our life to honor God with how we lead our household spiritually. It's time for the men to step up and to wear that banner. It's time for you to say, I am going to worship and honor God by doing what he calls me to do, and that is to lead spiritually. A lot of us want the submission part, if we are honest. A lot of us, yes, I want the structure that's biblical. You don't even know the Bible. You want biblical marriage structure, but you don't know any truth that is scripture. If you want to operate in this God-honoring structure, you better be leading in it. Second part is a man speaks wisely. A man chooses his words wisely. If he's gonna honor his wife, he, he speaks and chooses his words wisely. Words will either build up or they'll tear, tear down, right? He, third, he leads passionately. We talked about leadership, but I'm talking about a passionate leadership that is centralized in this passage here in Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives as what? Christ loved the church and he gave himself up for her. What did Christ do for us? He gave his life. Husbands, men, future husbands, your call as a man of God is to sacrifice and to give of yourself for the betterment of your household to constantly be laying down, working and striving and passionately leading, just as Christ did. This is important. Fourth one, how does a man honor his wife? He does not compare, does not get caught in the comparison game. I mean, if you're ever here, if your husbands, if you're ever saying this, I just want you to check yourself. Well, Jim's wife doesn't do that. You don't compare. That's not honoring. And the fifth and final one is this. You treat her as a co-heir, equal in the eyes of God. You know, this quote here says, this reminds husbands that even though they have been given great authority within the marriage, their wives are equal to them in spiritual privilege and eternal importance. They are joint heirs. Let me tackle this passage here, weaker vessel. I know some of you are like, what does that mean? It's, it's, it's really, it, it says what it is. Some of your translations will say lesser vessel. That is a wrong writing. It is weaker. It, it's talking about in this time the physical limitations between men and women. It's a call to the man to honor his wife, knowing that predominantly that the woman is going to be the physically weaker one and to be the protector of the woman, not the abuser of one's power. Can I just say this? This is just a little side note. If you are abusing your power physically, you are not in the will of God no matter what. There is nothing there that aligns with that if you're doing that. So, and then it says here with this idea so that your prayers may not be hindered. I love this line because it's saying to the man, to the husband here, that if you are not living your life this way, if you're not leading this way, if you're not wearing this mantle well, there's a, there is a spiritual consequence to this. That should be heavy for us to carry. That there's spiritual consequences for me as the man. How I lead, there's consequences. How I, how I love and honor my wife, how I lead my family forward, there is consequences for that. Verses eight and nine, I gotta hurry. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy. Right here it's saying, finally, all of you. So we've talked to wives, we've talked to husbands. Now, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For this is who you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. 
finally, all of you, to everyone, no matter where you're at in this structure, have unity of mind. This idea of being unified, I tackle this in small groups this week. And I go really deep into these next couple passages here. But it's saying, finally, we've, we've talked about governing authorities. We've talked about masters. We've talked about family unit structures of husband and wife. And now the church, the broader church, all of you have these things. And what's the attitude it calls us to here? The attitude is this. The attitude of the people of God is first sympathy. We see that. Guys, as the people of God, we should be sympathetic for the broken. We should, be, we should have sympathy for those around us. It should break our heart when our neighbors are broken. We should have sympathy. We should show love. We should have a tender heart. And we should have a humble mind. Because it says, don't repay evil for evil, but bless to all of us. Now, this one really doesn't fit in our world, right? It seems like we live in a world, right, where if you do wrong to me, then I do what to you? I get even. I, I get what's due to me. This is a hard thing for the believer because it's saying, no, when there's wrong or there's things done to you, don't repay it with more evil. Instead, it even says, bless. Be so different. <coughs> Be so different. And then verses 10 and 12. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord, remember that, are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Like I said, I break this down deeper in groups this week. But I want to just read this passage to you. And I want you to take the last couple weeks of Peter. I want you to think about everything we've learned over the last couple weeks. We've been challenged to submit to hard things. We've been challenged to live godly and pure We've been challenged to live a life above reproach and to let our conduct be tied with the good news. All of these things we've, we've heard and we've heard, and I think the importance of it really hits home when you read this passage again. So let me read it, and I want you to think through it with that lens. All of these things that you know are true, that you know how you're called to live because biblically it tells us to, and then we read this line. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who don't, who do evil. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. I don't know about you, and I don't know where you are at today, but I want the face of the Lord to be on me and to hear my prayers. I don't want to be one of those ones that he's saying here, the one of the evil doers, the one who's saying one thing and living a different life. Church, hear me on this. This is a call to every believer to live a life of righteousness, to pursue purity, and to honor the structures God has put in place, and to pursue his sight being on us, not against us. Amen? Would you all stand with me? We're gonna close with this prayer. God, we love you and we praise you. Pray that as we go about our week this week that you would just continue to be honored and worshiped by how we live and how we operate our life. Let us seek your face of approval with our conduct and our actions and how you call us to live. We love you. We praise you. It's in your name. Amen.